second version when we are completed or when that is available. So again, if everybody is ready to go, please make sure your feedback um, color is set to green and we are ready to go. And at this point, I would like to turn it over to Bob Long. Bob? Thank you, Deanne. And good morning, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, my colleague Steve Muse and I are planning to just kind of walk through of the topic of interest today, uh, patient safety and satisfaction through business intelligence methodologies using SQL Server, Dynamic CRM, and SharePoint services. And, Deanne, can you advance the slide? I can. Uh, fair warning today, we will uh, use at least one acronym rather frequently, and that is uh, BI, as a shorthand for business intelligence. And Steve is head of our uh, very successful BI practice, and perhaps some of you have seen prior BI webcasts. Um, today we turn our attention towards healthcare-specific BI efforts, and that's where I come in as I look after our Nudesic healthcare practice. Uh, today's slide deck is available uh, to you upon request. You'll see our e email addresses again at the completion of this webcast. Yeah, I need to go down two slides. Yes. And for some reason... I've got control again. Thank you. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Our agenda today includes an introduction of myself and your uh followed by an overview of the definition and concepts uh, behind our business intelligence programs. And this includes the various means uh, available for collecting and recording data for subsequent conversion to information, and then presented for purposes of process improvement. We'll speak about your potential to deploy dashboards, but also integrate with your existing systems. We'll also discuss the means to enhance the quality of care with Microsoft Customer Relationship Management, or the other acronym, CRM, tools uh, when deployed along with presentation um, applications such as SharePoint Portal Services. Now, having access to accurate up-to-the-minute information from your disparate systems is essential for making the best quality of care and uh, business decisions possible. Uh, we'd like to help you see just how powerful your data really is. And in order to accomplish this, uh, we will cover an introduction of what we chose as the scope of the presentation and discussion today. Uh, we'll discuss the planning involved in a business intelligence project and the vision. And determining, the, determining those core measures and criteria uh, necessary for success. Uh, we'll talk about participation within the hospital or your integrated delivery network. Um, we'll talk about uh, architecting uh, BI deployment, including leveraging your assets, uh, technology selection, um, dashboarding versus scorecarding, for example. And then uh, we'll work out the rollout and post-launch ideas, uh, including hospital-wide participation and training, and the adoption of continuous uh, process improvement, which really is the underlying theme of everything we speak of today. And then we'll close out with some uh, long-term benefits and remarks. Now, first on New Jessic, uh we have offices located nationwide, and we also have international operations. Uh, we've delivered systems across the full spectrum of healthcare, including clients ranging uh, from providers to plans and life sciences and research as well. Uh, Inc. Magazine has rated us one of the fastest-growing uh, privately held companies in the United States. And finally, we are also uh, the original members of the Microsoft Connected Systems Division uh, Virtual Tech Specialist Program, as they call it, uh, which means that BizTalk Server and connectivity and collaboration and really knowledge-driven healthcare uh, are, are a major core competency for us. Now, the Nudesic Healthcare Practice interweaves five primary technology practices within the company. Primary importance today is SQL Server is the basis uh, for our exploitation of uh, the fullest means for facilitating uh, BI. Uh, you'll hear plenty about this. Um, Microsoft Dynamics, against Customer Relationship Management, or CRM, uh, plays a key role in completing the loop for uh, continuous process improvement back into, to patient satisfaction. Now, SharePoint services will um, enable the portals for collaboration purposes uh, across the hospital. And our connected system group facilitates integration to bring the necessary data into play. And we accomplish this with uh, career experts, basically, in HL7 and, and HIPAA communications. 
And finally, our, our custom application development team uh, allows us to meet unique needs among our healthcare provider clients. And this competition, this combination of talent really is what uh, sets me desic apart. Now, a little bit about definition. Our, our approach to business intelligence in, involves both clinical and financial metrics and allows for tracking of care delivery issues in pursuit of op optimized patient safety, quality of care, and satisfaction. And from our point of view, this, this enables um, continuous process improvement strategies, and, and the result should be a patient-centric environment, uh, something measurable in concrete terms. And we think that uh, this is true such that you could um, link executive compensation and affiliate it with uh, systems such as this. So today, uh, we'll focus on the how aspect. Uh, we, we are assuming uh, that you've made the decision either to uh, proceed with a dashboarding strategy, a BI strategy, or perhaps you want to get more out of what you currently have in place. Uh, so in order to accelerate the discussion, our, our concentration will be um, the means to get there. Now, uh, this slide represents the continuous cycle of data collection, uh, feedback, decisions, resolution, and improvement. And we'll, first, we'll utilize this image uh, to, to allow you to follow the segments of the presentation today. So once program sponsorship is assured, there are many program elements and participants to consider. Uh, you see a little bit of a list here. and That's why I say this slide deck might be um, helpful to you afterwards. So let's take a closer look at that, um, at what comes next at this point. Now, the fundamental choices you make should be based on a vision, either universal or unique, uh, but well understood within the organization. We're going to uh, ponder many options today, uh, but select just a few to concentrate on. We will explain those choices and why we picked them, although your needs uh, can certainly vary. Uh, BI is, of course, a, a wide field of endeavor. Now, what would your organization want to accomplish? Uh, have you done this before? We, we do run into people who have done BI implementations, and maybe they faltered a little bit, and, and they want to continue or pick up a new direction. Uh, what are the goals and rewards? Are they, are they well known? It's very helpful to identify those up front. Um, things like types of dashboard. Uh, we can identify static analytical performance dashboards that will be part of what Steve speaks about. And these apply to different people within your organization and allow them different types of interaction. Now, we'll talk today about metrics versus indicators, uh, which brings to mind the hierarchy from frontline status type information to indicators that may be the result of aggregated information. Uh, also, would perhaps a paper performance program be of benefit? Uh, and this is something that often involves the physicians themselves. And we'd like to examine many of these with you. And again, we'll, we'll choose a path uh, of one particular example. Now, as a uh, more detailed background of what we think of when we refer, we refer to BI for providers, uh, what we have in mind is uh, data collected from disparate systems uh, beyond you know, above and beyond the hospital information system, such as perhaps pure accounting software. And it is the real-time access to this information uh, from, the, from the many systems on-premises and off that will make or break the BI implementation. Now, um, how can you even think to risk bringing decisions to bear on your organization uh, based on faulty data, right? So this is, this is a critical piece. Uh, tracking clinical data for the best quality care and also reporting for financial optimization purposes, kind of a, a dual uh, responsibility there, often stemming really from the same initial data. We'll explain the means to analyze trends and identify uh, the recurring issues coming from systems or personnel. And another choice to make, uh, and we'll take the choice in the direction of yes today, uh, do you need a data warehouse? This approach will support online analysis. And finally, through uh, use of customer relationship management or CRM software, uh, we can allow you to route issues that come up uh, to the appropriate people, uh, do so in a timely fashion, um, and there are fantastic um, exchange 
integrated possibilities here with CRM and the, the benefits across the platform um, and among the Microsoft stack offering are, are fantastic. So you'll see, get a good view of that today. Now let's spend a few moments uh, discussing your BI deployment strategy as we formulate this into a methodology. When we refer to BI for providers, what we have in mind is the following, which we would take into consideration while working directly with the stakeholders in your organization. Now, how will you plan to how will you plan, monitor, and analyze? Uh, concepts we can help you consider include balanced scorecarding, um, leading versus lagging indicators, um, leading allowing you more future uh, insight, for example. Um, are you well situated today for your CMS reporting, Part D, uh, for prescription drug programs, for example? Um, the collection of the data we're talking about today can assist you in that, in that path. Uh, how is your staff going to be engaged? Uh, there, we encourage uh, coaching and mentoring programs, and in fact, that can be taken to the extent that um, certifications could be devised uh, for promotion and merit among employees. And, and that way you reward the, uh, the, the willing and the, uh, the partners, basically, the people who want to get involved. Now, uh, do you plan to track and analyze routine processes, uh, such as admission, discharge, transfer, ADT? Um, we'd like to help you uh, improve wait times, um, patient flow, and this became, begins with data tracking and what we'll talk about as um, Let's call them key performance indicators or KPIs today. And together, we can identify and incorporate uh, system-generated metrics and look forward to the outcomes and the results of all this and make this available through reporting. And ultimately, then, the entire system is auditable uh, to support your, your journaling for appropriate compliance. Now, in order to address the uh, questions we just discussed, you need access to certain business metrics that drive performance improvement, as well as patient satisfaction and outcome. This is how we look at providing BI solutions um, by determining alongside our clients what metrics uh, could provide the ability to react, respond, and improve. For many hospitals, some of these are uh, resource utilization metrics, for example, uh, scheduled tests and procedures for today and the future, uh, possibly with historical trends, uh, the availability of unscheduled tests, procedures to ensure we don't turn away or lose business, uh, census metrics, um, looking at occupancy, um, staffing needs, uh, currently scheduled staff per role, can I look down the road and get a uh, comparison of scheduled versus needed, you know, depending on trends. And then, for that matter, uh, payer data metrics. Uh, for my claims processing transactions, um, show me the details on payer mix, or how much from whom, payer AR aging, show them to me in a fashion that I want to see them, along with drill downs, and the detail available if I want it, and with daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly uh, historical comparisons, ready uh, when and if I need them. So details on patient procedures with information such as treatment, treatment costs per doctor, and now we ask how can we gain access to those metrics. Okay, and that's through adopting this type of program and getting it into a situation where you engage vendors and begin the delivery process. So after we've looked at some of the needs and made some of the needs decisions, if you will, uh, we'll look at the the um, how to proceed, the very first steps. What, what have you got to do? You're going to look at the vendors. So we've spoken uh, about Microsoft uh, licensing. Uh, several products. Uh, we are a dedicated um, Microsoft Services company, uh, so those are two key components of the of the assumptions today. And leveraging existing assets, uh, we wanted to make sure you understood that none of this is overlooked. These systems uh, generally adapt to what's in place, uh, whether your your HIS, uh, maybe even existing reporting tools that that are more perhaps limited in some way. And ultimately, you, you may have an existing interface engine. Uh, we are, we have a connected systems group, a very strong proponent of BizTalk server. Uh, but you may have an interface engine that, that we would connect to through HL7 or other means. 
And again, we have people on staff that are quite expert at that. So we can get out the data. Now, dashboards are intended to access all the information coming in from across the hospital or IDN and from outside entities as well. And then the system will seek to isolate what the user requires to perform his job and make informed decisions. This being the case, uh, without end user involvement, a dashboarding project will not do so well. Um, and then this information will refer to as, again, key performance indicators or KPIs. Now, a well-conceived dashboard will seek to do more than just solve a problem, but more appropriately help drive future successes uh, for each business unit. And what you see here uh, are a variety of entities uh, inside and outside of the hospital, uh, hospital at the center of the universe, uh, but dealing with, with many outside parties. Now, if, if a dashboard helps to drive uh, business unit success, it will become an indisp indispensable tool for these users in the community. So you might say, Rome is burning, you know, what next? Uh, what will the user do, uh, want to do to solve a problem? And, and this is an important question. Can we provide online instructions, for example? And, and this is where the power of a fully integrated office and SharePoint solution comes into play. Now, we've made some, uh, excuse me, so the, uh, one of the first steps involved in, a, in initiating a program, we believe, is, is storyboarding the process in some form or fashion. Uh, this will enable the existing processes to be brought into light and evaluated, allowing the new system to be visualized better. And this can be done with the necessary stakeholders uh, representing each department. Um, this is a logical step toward the eventual um, adoption of the system as well. And the BI implementation can directly allow employees to receive feedback, uh, potentially allow for merit or recognition, as we mentioned, to, to keep them engaged, or conversely lead to the opportunity for uh, recovery, you might say, through uh, internet or intranet sites and training options. Uh, the data warehouse enables analysis, as I mentioned before, and provides the foundation for the informatics group uh, within the hospital and while driving the performance dashboard, as you see on the uh, lower left. And this web-based uh, patient feedback system that we've mentioned um, should be in the loop, could be in the loop to uh, look at CRM and, and take these indicators, roll them up, and add to the overall insight provided for optimization purposes. And an interesting statistic, of course, that emerges from this, all, all up, you might say, is patient satisfaction. Again, we, we think that can be utilized and linked in important ways to other things, such as I think 40% or some large percent of hospitals today link this to executive compensation. Now, we're going to uh, move into the next phase, and Steve is going to take over for me, and uh, I'll enjoy doing the little introduction for you. And now we'll take a look at the more technical aspects of a BI implementation from our, our practice manager. Steve? Thank you, Bob. So welcome, everybody. My name is Steve Muse, and um, if you've been here before and heard me speak, um, thanks for coming back. If this is your first time, um, I apologize if I get a little excited and start talking fast, um, but feel free to interrupt or uh, ask any questions that you have uh, at the end, and we'll address those. And then if there's any follow-up questions that you may have about some of the stuff that I'm talking about, um, feel free to uh, bring those up later on. I'd be more than happy to... Um, to discuss those uh, at a later date. And so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about up in front some of the types of dashboards that we've, um, we've been building for our clients and some of the purposes and reasons for them. Um, I'm going to show you some screenshots from a demo that we have, an actual virtual machine demo. Uh, for the sake of time today, though, we, um, we're not going to actually spin it up. So I'll show you some screenshots from it, some of the functionality and capabilities that we've built into it. Um, I'll talk about some of the technologies that are in play um, there um, from kind of a product standpoint. And then um, uh, following that, then we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, sort of the kind of the engagement model. Uh, if you were to take this on and you wanted to start building something like this, kind of the steps that you'd want to uh, consider up in front um, uh, from a planning standpoint. And then, um, you know, and then we'll kind of go from there and then Bob has some things to wrap up at the end. Um, and I'll, I'll just say this up in front. If anybody is interested in seeing, uh, you know, the full virtual demo that we've got, um, just 
feel free to contact Dion, we can, or Bob, we can arrange that. Um, that should be no problem at all. So, uh, Bob made mention earlier about the different, uh, the various types of dashboards that are out there. We talk about static versus analytic versus performance dashboards. Um, and there's various reasons for um, the utilization of these kind of techniques. And they're, you know, it's interesting that they, they, they get categorized mostly by, by press, um, unfortunately. And what they do is they end up kind of grouping these things up in ways that make sense to them so that they can communicate it. And that makes perfect sense. Um, the problem is, is that most of the time when we start doing the implementation, um, occasionally they fall into these very um, dramatic buckets. But oftentimes what we'll run into is kind of a hybrid of these. So what I'll do is I'll talk just briefly about kind of the features of each one of them. So from the static dashboard, what we're talking about is something generally we refer to it as is the static structure and dynamic data. So this is typically uh, anywhere from 65 to 75% of the people inside of an organization um, that will be looking at um, uh, performance data. And they'll be looking at it within the very scope and kind of realm of their responsibilities. So, you know, patient admittal, and um, their responsibility is to reduce wait times and uh, to not turn away, you know, to reduce uh, turn away. So they have these very specific metrics that they're, they're looking at. Um, probably uh, very limited kind of drill down, except to maybe a specific incident. Um, not a lot of drill through and other types of information. Uh, for the most part, they're looking at a handful of four or five or six numbers. And that's, a, you know, a fairly good metric of a good portion of their job. Um, there's another group of, you know, people within an organization, typically about another 15% in most organizations. It varies depending on you know, kind of the culture that's fall into these analytic dashboards. Analytic dashboards are more around kind of root cause analysis. Uh, these are the people that kind of want to pivot on data. They want to filter data. They want to slice it and dice it. We've, you know, we've kind of heard these terms before. Uh, these are the people that uh, play in Excel a lot, and they like to get, you know, big data downloads and then put it in Excel and kind of manage and massage the data around um, and get a feel for, you know, what's going on within the organization. Um, they may be interested in doing things like forecasting and trend analysis. Um, they might be doing all kinds of interesting pieces um, with some of the different uh, BI tools that are out there. So if you've got today, you know, some of the Cognos Power Play stuff or TM1 or some of the other, you know, uh, kind of analytic ad hoc tools. These are the people that would typically be using those. And then lastly is your performance dashboards. And these are specifically around kind of performance metrics. Uh, Bob made mention a few minutes ago of the key performance indicators. Um, and these are typically the key performance indicators. And what this is, and I'll, and I'll show you a sample of all this stuff in just a few minutes. Um, but what typically this is, is this is known as the scorecard. Um, this is the red light, yellow light, green light. This is the, you know, here's the top 15 or 20 uh, performance metrics that we as a corporation have decided that we're going to drive towards enhancing performance. And if we, you know, enhance the performance of these metrics, we will increase our profit, decrease our loss, uh, improve stockholder value, um, There'll be some sort of, you know, fiscal financial, um, you know, performance enhancement if we drive these performance metrics. And so typically these will be um, on executive and managerial dashboards that will show specifically around kind of the performance of a team, of an organization, a division, a department, or an entire corporation. Um, and, and so you'll see bits and pieces of these on, on a lot of dashboards, you know, on the financial CFO dashboard. He'll have, you know, uh, a good piece of them. The COO, you know, operations officers will have some of them. Um, the IOs, if you have them, will have some of them. You know, CEO may have some of them. Um, and occasionally you'll see them all rolled up into one. But typically most dashboards, when you talk about performance dashboards, you're talking about um, the performance metrics that, you know, apply to the people that are within that organization, depending on their location on the org chart. Let me put, there we go. So as we start looking at, you know, once we start thinking those through the ways that we're going to begin to deliver data and the way that we begin to allow people to interact with the data, you know, then we start we start talking about architecting for, you know, the business intelligence. And so you saw this slide a couple of times, and you notice the box is a little bit farther down now. 
in the middle of the page, you know, closer to the, you know, kind of upper middle, talking about the architecting for business intelligence. And this is where we start the planning process. And this is where uh, typically your analysts, or your business analysts, start getting involved around um, term definitions. Um, oftentimes what we find is that the same uh, number um, within an organization may be called two or three different things. Or conversely, um, the same term may in fact be defined uh, two or three different ways within an organization. So as we start going through, we have to start identifying those and figuring out where all of our data lies um, and how we're going to get access to it. Uh, we start looking at infrastructure as far as servers for um, portals and servers for databases. Um, we start looking at some of the desktop tools that are available within an organization. Um, there's a whole host of pieces that kind of go into the planning phase. Um, but as you begin to start considering, you know, what the rollout of this business intelligence, you know, infrastructure and interface are going to look like, you certainly have to start taking into consideration some of the costs up in front. Um, at New Deathic, we, we actually have a 30-day um, agile BI life cycle um, where we can come in, do a little bit of analytics, do a little bit of you know, infrastructure work, do a little bit of a data warehouse, a little bit of an analysis services cube, a little bit of a dashboard. In the 30 days, you know, at the end of 30 days, effectively get you know, uh, the first of a dashboard up. It may not be a lot, but it's something. And then we can kind of iterate on it. Um, so what that allows us to do is then as we're, we're actually planning, as we're implementing, we're a couple days in advance. Um, some other organizations like to do the planning a little bit more um, up in front, and so they begin to understand costs and expenses and timelines up in front. Um, and if that's the case, then you certainly need to plan for that as well. Um, and typically, you know, you definitely can come in and help you with stuff like that. Um, or if you have somebody in-house that, that um, has, knows this, but you, know, you're usually typically in a, any kind of a project size, about 20% of the time, um, to 15% could be spent just in the planning and architecting phase. So as we start talking about kind of Microsoft business intelligence, so one of the true benefits and the competitive advantages that Microsoft has um, from a business intelligence standpoint is, is they actually do a couple of things. So one of the pieces that – so in the BI space, there's a number of other tools. And everybody, I mean, you know, people are familiar with most of them, the Cognoses, the MicroStrategies, the Business Objects. Um, and most of the other BI tools out there are pretty good solutions. Um, and when I say that, uh, you know, they, they provide a, a good amount of functionality. Um, but what they don't do is they don't provide a great platform. And when I say that, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in just a minute. In the past, Microsoft has been more about the platform where they gave you things, and if you'll look down here at the bottom, the blue boxes, they gave you the, the data warehouse, they gave you the, you know, the ETL or the, you know, the tools to move the data from source systems into data warehouses, they gave you the OLAP cube, they gave you some simple reporting functionality, and all of that came with a single product. Now that was great as long as you had in-house developers that knew what they were doing and knew how to build on that platform. And with that platform, you could build any number of really cool solutions. And we did it for years and years and years. We built our own solutions on top of the Microsoft platform. Um, and then Microsoft came along with Performance Point, and they started enhancing Excel, and they started enhancing SharePoint um, into the business intelligence space. And so now not only do we have the same kind of stable platform um, with SQL Server, which is uh, clearly um, from, an, uh, from an ETL and analysis services and reporting services, and even the data base now has actually become world-class, you know, a very competitive platform against uh, some of its other competitors. But now we actually, they've actually rounded it out to give us the solution piece as well. So now we actually have the front end as well. So one of the, you know, so you combine those two together and you end up with actually a fairly um, complete solution that, that uh, nobody really has a good, you know, they, they really line up one-on-one -on -one with. You know, Oracle's got a good database, but doesn't necessarily have a good BI solution. You know, MicroStrategy is a decent BI solution, but doesn't really have a database. Um, you know, they've, they've got some functionality for providing that, that kind of feature, but it's not necessarily anything that's going to, that's scalable outside of the MicroStrategy 
environment. So your Cognos cubes and your MicroStrategy cubes, you can't use them, you know, in any other kind of functionality, you know, whereas with the Microsoft cubes, you actually can. You can embed them inside of web applications or address them through web applications, through SharePoint, through Excel, through a host of other, you know, kind of features and functions. So, ooh, beautiful slide. So, for this piece is actually, I know it's hard to see, is actually what they call the Microsoft BI stack. And what it does, it shows, and clearly nobody can see what it shows. Um, both, well, I can describe it to you in the fact that it basically, similar to the previous slide, it actually puts a few more kind of tools in place to show, that it depicts how you can use um, a number of third-party uh, back-end databases, and you can kind of make up the Oracle and the SAP and the Siebel's, um, how we can use those back-end database data sources. We can actually consolidate them into a single data environment, um, either in a data warehouse or in an analysis and services cubes, um, which is uh, more analogous to like a data mark. Um, and then we can address these through, you know, end-user tools like Excel, um, and then present it all through SharePoint. And so one of the things you notice in, in one of the value propositions of the Microsoft platform slash solution, again, is that you end up with this single pane of glass. So when you get to this kind of upper bun piece here, and that's why they call it the hamburger slide, you have this kind of upper bun at the top. When you get to this point, the end users are completely oblivious to the complexity that lies underneath it. So the fact that something came through Excel or through reporting services and the data came from SAP or Siebel, there's a detail and implementation that the end users who are up there at the SharePoint interface portion of it are completely oblivious to. And so we now have the ability to kind of surface all of this, you know, information to them in a single pane of glass, um, which allows the end users to then easily and kind of natively interact with it in a way that makes sense to them. Um, without having to go from one environment to another environment to another environment, um, which, you know, with, with kind of the other competing products that are out there, that may in fact be the case. Um, you know, if you had a Cognos environment, you'd have to go there for your analytics. Um, but if you had a collaboration environment, you know, document management, um, you may have to go someplace else for that information. So, again, with the Microsoft solution, you have the ability to kind of pull all this together into a single environment. In fact, we get some screenshots to get a chance to take a look at it. So, you know, the point here in this slide is really actually talking about even with the right tools, um, it's still about the implementation. And so, you, you know, my recommendation, and I'm not going to go through this whole slide, um, but let me just um, recommend to you that even with the right tools, so you, you say you decide tomorrow that, yeah, you know what, the Microsoft BI stack is a great way to go. Let's roll with it. Um, one of the the trends that we've seen in the past, um, and it's actually kind of a, it's a, the knock against Microsoft, if you will, is that Microsoft, with their tools, made it so easy to build databases and cubes and dashboards that everyone did. Um, but those people that did didn't necessarily know, you know, what they were building or how to build it, you know, in a way that made good sense and was going to last for a while. So what ended up happening was you ended up with these databases that were out there uh, that were poorly planned and poorly designed, um, but they were built because it was easy to. You know, a series of right clicks here and there, you follow a couple of wizards, um, and all of a sudden, bada boom, bada bing, you created yourself a database, and you can start stuffing, you know, data into it. Um, but there's a real science behind kind of the implementation process of it and some, you know, best practices and some patterns um, that if you've been through the process a handful of times, you begin to understand. You know, and that's, you know, part of it is around the Kimball methodology, for those people that are familiar with that. Um, but there's a whole lot more to it. Um, so the point behind this is that, you know, if there's something that Nudessa can do to help, we'd be more than happy to. If not, you, know, you want to make sure that you find somebody that knows what they're doing um, that can help kind of guide you through the troubled waters on this. Um, even though the product seems like it's pretty simple and there's plenty of tech, you know, training out there, five-day courses and books and stuff like that, um, there's also a whole lot of additional information and experience that you're going to want to make sure you bring to the table on this. Um, one of the, the scary parts about, you know, BI solutions is that when you start to build them, they, uh, everybody sees them. Uh, they become very popular um, the, and everybody kind of up to the org chart sees them. So, 
It's one of those things when you kind of pull back the covers on it, typically you want to want to have a, you know, be fairly confident that you've done it well and that it's going to be around for a while. So let me just race through a couple of screenshots real quick of some of the things that we've, uh, we've built in this demo. So you'll see here a balanced scorecard, you know, that we've built using the Kaplan and Norton, you know, a, a methodology, so financial activity, pace of facing, people perspective, but the series of performance indicators and some metrics on here. Um, again, because we're in SharePoint, we also have access to document libraries. We also have access to report libraries. And we also, you know, buy all the native, uh, you know, navigation to be able to go around, jump around to other portals or sub-sites within the the the, um, the environment. And um, we also have some, and we have some indicators on here that say, you know, what here's our targets and and our performance to our targets are either doing well or they're doing okay or they're actually not doing very well, and we need to figure out how to begin to fix those. Um, you get the ability within performance point then to be able to right-click on things and begin to drill down into them, uh, to begin to filter and kind of pivot this information all inside of a web browser. We haven't actually opened up another tool. All we are at this point in time is inside of Internet Explorer. Uh, nothing new, nothing fancy, and no tools for anybody to have to learn. All they have to do is have a, you know, somewhat uh, some knowledge, working knowledge of the, uh, the data that they're looking at. Um, they also have the ability, so in this case, this uh, total outliners report. So you'll notice that the, this outliers performance indicator over here has been clicked on. So you have the ability in performance point now to click on any one of these KPIs listed here. And when you do actually flip the reports that show up on the right-hand side, this report, in fact, right here is actually an Excel spreadsheet. This Excel spreadsheet uh, was connected to an analysis services cube underneath and published by an analyst. So here's a report that was actually generated not by anybody inside of the IT department, but actually generated by an analyst who then just simply said, hey, you know what, when somebody clicks on the outliers uh, performance indicator, I want them to see this spreadsheet. Now the, that, you know, kind of connecting of this spreadsheet to this performance indicator instead of performance point uh, doesn't require any code. So an analyst with the proper training could easily do it. Um, it's just a simple dragging and dropping kind of thing, or it might have been IT that did it. Um, but even if it was, it was about a five-minute task. Um, you also have the ability to start doing some kind of more some more advanced visualizations. So with Performance Point, you actually, and with the Microsoft platform, you have the ability to bring in things like Visio and create uh, floor layouts. And those floor layouts, the data of the objects within those Visio uh, layouts can now be connected back to performance indicators. And so you can see we, we can actually begin to status those. Um, and they can be updated and refreshed. This isn't like a file that was saved with the colors like that. These are actually live connections uh, to data sources underneath with conditional logic that says if, if the data would have changed, then go ahead and change the color of one of these objects. And so that may include, you know, bed layouts. It may include uh, wait times. It may include you know, any number of things that we wanted to begin to track. And and so the, and these can be wired up and visualized right here in front of you. Um, it's a little bit of work to do it, but once it's done, uh, typically floor layouts don't change very often. Um, so once that's done, it can actually be uh, and wired up to the data source. It's actually a fairly uh, intuitive way for people to begin to see the data. Um, you can also wire it up to virtual work. You can begin to see kind of mapping, and this becomes interesting when you start to look at, you know, uh, your patient bases and maybe how far they're traveling and from which direction. Um, and to begin to see some trends around, you know, uh, drive directions and drive times. Um, there's any number of interesting features you can get into within the virtual earth space as well. Um, you also have, we also have the ability with a simple add-in within Excel to connect to the data source and begin to do some forecasting information. So you'll notice here that we have actuals, 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 and then right about here, this turns into a little dotted line. In the dotted line here, this is actually a forecasting function just simply done right inside of the cell um, with the data mining add-ins that are available. And it wasn't anything fancy. It was somebody, it was one of those analysts that just simply knew Excel um, that connected to a data source underneath um, analysis services, a very simple uh, connection uh, capability. And then you can actually, then the forecasting is something you can teach them how to do in, in an one hour. And we can begin to begin, you begin to do that forecasting on a regular basis. Um, in performance point, there's also the capability to do planning. 
So we can take those forecasting numbers that we did and actually go back and insert them in through Excel and begin to insert these numbers, these planning numbers or forecast numbers, if you will, um, back into, uh, in through Excel into an underlying data model that Performance Point uh, manages for us. And we can actually begin to trend actuals to forecast over a period of time so that when we get down to producing these KPIs, you'll notice up here on the right-hand side that I've got actuals listed here, and then I've got forecasts listed here and forecasts listed here and forecasts listed here. These are the numbers that came out of that input from that Excel spreadsheet. So the data, the numbers weren't stored in the Excel spreadsheet, as I mentioned. They were it's actually pushed back to a back-end data source and then pulled back up again through Performance Point. But this now gives the, your, your analyst and your financial uh, personnel the ability to begin to adjust those forecasts and to begin to track actuals against the forecast right here inside of the scorecard. Again, the code, there's no code required on this. It's just a simple drag and drop and assembly together, and then we publish this out into a SharePoint environment. So we talked about, you know, a little bit around implementation. I talked a little bit about planning before we got done. So some of the critical pieces that you want to consider as you begin to undertake a project like this is you know, think about, you know, some of the initial project envisions. You know, what is it that, what's our goal in this? What's our target? Um, you know, what is it that if we could do this, um, this project would be successful? Now you get into some of the deployment strategies, and that's talking about anywhere from hardware to end user involvement to user testing. Um, what are some of the core measures that these users are going to be interested in um, that are critical to their business function? Um, stakeholder involvement. Um, it's critical that you get stakeholder involvement early in, inside of the project and you get their buy-in and, and an understanding of what it's going to take both with a monetary investment and a time investment. Um, but the, with the envisioning portion at the top, there's also, you know, some true tangible benefits um, that they can hold on to and help you kind of continue to push this through. Um, we get into integration, development, and testing. Um, one of the interesting pieces, you know, around business intelligence projects that happens to be kind of a trend, unfortunately, um, that uh, we at Nudesic are fighting vigorously is uh, kind of sloping your lazy BI project. And what this is, this is a, you know, BI projects where uh, people don't necessarily have um, a testing plan they don't have real good uh, release to production plans. They don't have impact analysis plans. Um, there's a whole host of kind of just standard uh, things that in an application development project um, are fairly typical, um, you know, in an application lifecycle management that in BI projects, unfortunately, hasn't been, uh, is, is often left to the wayside. And so I, we're, we're very stringent and kind of very strict about making sure that these things are done properly and this avoids uh, errors, make sure that we have correct data, make sure that end users have a consistent experience. Um, and so with that, um, I'll hand it back over to Bob, and he's going to wrap up with a couple more slides before we get done here. Thanks for your time, and I hope this was informational, informative, and, and the information is going to be useful for you. Bob? Thank you, Steve. That was fantastic. Appreciate it. And now what I wanted to explore with you uh, was a little bit about uh, post-launch. Uh, you know, as we progress through this um, timeline of this presentation, we're, we're thinking in terms of uh, uh, you've, you've done it, you've put it out there, and uh, let's examine a little bit how to make sure you get the most from it. And iterating on some of the things you've commented about, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of commitment to the process that has to happen. Uh, adoption is vital. And uh, we suggest you find the advocates, you know, and uh, patient uh, or, or, excuse me, staff, uh, wards, and or discipline programs um, can help you progress toward this patient-centric environment that the, we, we think is, is the uh, absolute optimum and we, we believe is the goal for, you know, all in the audience. And that's why we bring up things like uh, the possibility to utilize a, a CRM-type program uh, and reach out and include patients in this process through, uh, through surveys, um, even maybe going so far as uh, newsletters and that sort of thing. But we, we think in terms of incorporating the, uh, the entire community in the uh, eventual process here. So uh, post-deployment strategies, uh, you've, you've got the system in there. You're looking at information. What else can you do? Um, and, and we think of 
process improvement in patient satisfaction is leading naturally to other elements of patient uh, safety and quality of care uh, to achieve an, an overall care score uh, that's the best that it can be. And, you know, obviously in the right environment, uh, happy patients are going to be healthy patients and, and conversely. Uh, we mentioned early the possibilities uh, for pay for performance, uh, depending on which of the tools you choose to implement, the things that, you know, Steve and I have talked about today. Uh, you, you can be well on your way uh, toward having a foundation for a pay for performance uh, physician scorecard capability. And part of the idea, just to mention that when you want to uh, include that uh, extended community, if you will, uh, it might facilitate um, clinical trial recruitment might make it just that much easier if the hospital is, is widely known and, and admired in, in the surrounding area. So just a few ideas for you. And, and we hope through this process of discussing the technology and discussing the, the programs and the potential and the fact that the vendor and, and the hospital itself uh, need to be tightly integrated through this entire process. And if that all adds up, uh, and we think it does, uh, then, you know, we'd be thrilled to, to work with you. And I uh, would look forward to your questions today uh, or afterwards. Uh, you can contact Steve or myself or uh, email us through Dion, who's our, our coordinating today. And uh, thank you so much for your time. I uh, hope it was valuable to you, and uh, we enjoyed it. Thank you both very much. Uh, what an absolutely stellar presentation, very informative. A couple of questions. Um, Bob, what in your experience has been one of the best places to start with a with something like this? So um, we're not biting off more than we can chew, but we can um, come up with a good plan to start so that we can be successful. Well, I, I might suggest the emergency department uh, because it, it's the most uh, uh, imminent situation for patient interaction. And, and these days, too, we're, we're trying to get to a scenario where, not everybody does go to the ED, first of all, and they, they go to clinics and, and pursue other options, even perhaps online, uh, you know, self-serve type care. Uh, but at any rate, uh, most of the expense is going to occur in the emergency department and uh, the patient flow and the statistics around that, the type of care that's delivered at the ED um, is, is probably where I'd suggest we, we attack first. Okay. And then I think for both of you, a question for both of you, where have going, you know, organizations that go through this process, where have they seen some of their savings? Because right, we're all in that space right now where we need to do more with less and um, costs are, are very high on the radar right now. So by implementing this, this process, what can we hope to get out of it? What's a good ROI? Well, I'll, I'll take a, a quick one and then see if you've got one. Great. Um, but I, I'm thinking in terms of uh, resource utilization, I, either personnel or, or physical resources, so that uh, we look at um, procedures and costs and equipment that might uh, uh, either be static at times and underutilized, or conversely, uh, where you might um, have, be turn, turning away, you, you might have um, capacity that you could build and, and plan into your future. So I, I think that's where some of the greatest economic impact could occur. Okay. Steve? Well, and so typically the clients that we've seen, one of the things we were able to do was uh, by leveraging uh, software they typically already own. So it's not uncommon for an organization to already own you know, Microsoft SQL Server, uh, Microsoft SharePoint, um, and then we combine those using, you know, some of the fun features and functions that are there they can begin to uh, look at getting ready to some of the other ancillary software that they're purchasing. So today they may have, you know, be paying, paying licensing fees for, um, you know, crystal reports, and if they migrate those over onto reporting services, um, then they can uh, get rid of that licensing cost. Um, if we can replicate some of the uh, functionality that they have in their Cognos environments or MicroStrategy environments um, using Performance Point, um, then they can reduce, and Performance Point, by the way, is uh, substantially less than a Cognos or um, mm -hmm. a MicroStrategy licensing, uh, they can begin to reduce licensing costs there as well. Um, and then I think uh, Bob mentioned it as well. From a resourcing standpoint, um, it's for the most part generally uh, easier to find 
and replace and train up uh, resources on Microsoft's uh, technology than on a Cognos MicroStrategy mm -hmm. Crystal environment. And then, I mean, you can see that by just going down to the bookstore, right? Go to Barnes and Noble and look, you know, look in the, you know, in the, the database computer section for a book on Cognos versus a book on reporting services. Right. And you'll find a, a dozen books on, you know, the Microsoft technology and nothing on any of the others. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Well, I think that concludes our session for today. Again, thank you both so much for your time today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We will reach out um, with the slide deck from today as well as the recorded version when it is available. Um, in the meantime, again, like Bob had said, please feel free to reach out to myself or Bob. We'll be happy to answer any questions you have in the meantime. And again, this again the webcast was recorded. We'll send that out to you. Um, so on behalf of New Desk, Bob and Steve, thanks very much, and have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.